Drin opened his eyes and gave her an angry look. We earned nothing, he protested. It was our parents and grandparents whom the witch asked for help, and I'll grant you that they were as much to blame as Haggard in their own way. We would have handled the matter quite differently. And every middle-aged face in the room scowled at every older face. One of the old men spoke up in a voice that wheezed and meowed. You would have done just as we did. There were crops to harvest and stock to tend, as they still are. There was Haggard to live with, as there still is. We know very well how you would have behaved. You're our children. Drin glowered him down, and other men began to shout spitefully, but the magician quieted them all by asking, What was the curse? Could it have anything to do with the Red Bull? The name rang coldly, even in the bright room, and Molly suddenly felt lonely. On an impulse, she added her own question, though it had nothing to do with the conversation. Have any of you ever seen a unicorn? It was then that she learned two things. The difference between silence and utter silence, and that she had been quite right to ask that question. The Hagsgate faces tried not to move, but they did move. Drin said carefully, We've never seen the bull, and we never speak of him. Nothing that concerns him can be any business of ours. As for unicorns, there are none. There never were. He poured the black wine again. I will tell you the words of the curse, he said. He folded his hands before him and began to chant. You whom Haggard holds in thrall, share his feast and share his fall. You shall see your fortune flower till the torrent takes the tower. Yet none but one of Hagsgate town may bring the castle swirling down. A few others joined in as he recited the old maledection. Their voices were sad and far, as though they were not in the room at all, but were tumbling in the wind high over the inn's chimney, helpless as dead leaves. What is it about their faces, Molly wondered. I almost know. The magician sat silently by her, rolling his wine glass in his long hands. When those words were first spoken, Drin said, Haggard had not been long in the country, and all of it was still soft and blooming, all but the town of Hagsgate. Hagsgate was then as this land has become, a scrabbly, bare place where men put great stones on the roofs of their huts to keep them from blowing away. He grinned bitterly at the older men. Crops to harvest, stock to tend. You grew cabbages and rutabagas and a few pale potatoes. And in all of Hagsgate, there was but one weary cow. Strangers thought the town accursed, having offended some vindictive witch or another. Molly felt the unicorn go by in the street, then turn and come back, restless as the torches on the walls that bowed and wriggled. She wanted to run out to her, but instead she asked quietly, and afterward, when that had come true? Drin answered, from that moment, we have known nothing but bounty. Our grim earth has grown so kind that gardens and orchards spring up by themselves. We need neither to plant nor to tend them. Our flocks multiply, our craftsmen become more clever in their sleep. The air we breathe and the water we drink keep us from ever knowing illness. All sorrow parts to go around us. And this has come about while the rest of the realm, once so green, has shriveled to cinders under Haggard's hand. For fifty years, none but he and we have prospered. It is as though all others have been cursed. Share his feast and share his fall, Schmendrick murmured. I see. I see. He gulped another glass of the black wine and laughed. But old King Haggard still rules and will until the sea overflows. You don't know what a real curse is. Let me tell you my troubles. Easy tears suddenly glittered in his eyes. To begin with, my mother never liked me. She pretended, but I knew. Drin interrupted him, and just then, Molly realized what the strange, what was strange about the folks of Hagsgate. Every one of them was well and warmly dressed. But the faces that peered out of their fine clothes were the faces of poor people, cold as ghosts and too hungry to eat. Drin said, Yet none but one of Hagsgate town may bring the castle swirling down. 
How can we delight in our good fortune when we know that it must end, and that one of us will end it? Every day makes us richer and brings us one day nearer to our doom. Magician, for fifty years we have lived leanly, avoided attachments, untied all habits, readying ourselves for the sea. We have not taken not a moment's joy, in our wealth or in anything else, for joy is just one more thing to lose. Pity Hagsgate, strangers, for in all the wretched world there can be no more town unhappy. Lost, 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 the townsfolk whimpered. Misery, misery we. Molly Grew stared wordlessly at them, but Schmendrick said respectfully, That's a good curse. That's a professional job. I always say, whatever you're having done, go to an expert. It pays in the long run. Drin frowned, and Molly nudged Smendrick. The magician blinked. Oh, well, what is it you wish of me? I must warn you that I'm not a very skillful sorcerer, but I will be glad to lift this curse from you if I can. I had not taken you for any more than you are, Drin answered, but such as you are, you should do as well as any. I think we will leave the curse the way it is. If it were lifted, we might not become poor again, but we would grow no longer steadily richer, and that would be just as bad. No, our real task is to keep Haggard's tower from falling, and since the hero who will destroy it will only come from Hagsgate, this should not be impossible. For one thing, we allowed no strangers to settle here. We keep them away by force if we must, but more often by guile. Those dark tales of Hagsgate that you spoke of, we invented them ourselves, and spread them as widely as we could to make sure that we would have few visitors. He smiled proudly with his hollow jaws. Schmendrick propped his chin on his knuckles and regarded Drin with a sagging smile. What about your own children? he asked. How can you keep one of them from growing up to fulfill the curse? He looked around the inn, sleepily studying every wrinkled face that looked back at him. Come to think of it, he said slowly. Are there no young people in this town? How early do you send children to bed in Hagsgate? No one answered him. Molly could hear blood creaking in ears and eyes and skin twitching like water plucked by the wind. Then, Drin said, We have no children. We have had none since the day that the curse was laid upon us. He coughed into his fist and added, It seemed the most obvious way of foiling the witch. Schmendrick threw back his head and laughed without making a sound, laughed to make the torches dance. Molly realized that the magician was quite drunk. Drin's mouth disappeared, and his eyes hardened into cracked porcelain. I see no humor in our plight, he said softly. None at all. None, Schmendrick gurgled, bowing over the table and spilling his wine. None, pardon me, none, none at all. Under the angry gaze of two hundred eyes, he managed to recover himself and reply seriously to Drin. Then it would seem to me that you have no worries, none that would worry you anyways. A small wee of laughter sneaked out between his lips like steam from a tea kettle. So it would seem, Drin le leaned forward and touched Smendrick's wrist with two fingers. But I have not told you all the truth. Twenty-one years ago, a child was born in Hagsgate. Whose child it was, we never knew. I found it myself as I was crossing the marketplace one winter's night. It was lying on a butcher's block, not crying, although there was snow, but warm and chuckling under a comforter of straw cat, stray cats. They were all purring together, and the sound was heavy with knowledge. I stood by the strange cradle for a long time, pondering while the snow fell and the cats purred prophecy. He stopped, and Molly Grew said eagerly, You took the child home with you, of course, and raised it as your own. Drin laid his hands, palm up on the table. I chased the cats away, he said, and went home alone. Molly's face turned the color of mist. Drin shrugged slightly. I know the birth of a hero when I see it, he said. Omens and portents, snakes in the nursery. Had it not been for the cats, I might have chanced the child. But they made it so obvious, so mythological. What was I to do? Knowingly harbor Hag Hag Hagsgate's doom? His lips twitched, as though a hook had set in it. As it happened, I erred. 
but it was on the side of tenderness. When I returned at sunrise the baby had vanished.